you know, once you think you're God's gift to investing, you better watch out. I used to tell people that, you know, they say, why are you so calm dealing with billions of dollars? And I said, well, I've, I've piloted a ship through the Straits of Juan de Fuca. You know, we study human nature a lot in this, in this business, either formally or informally. And the institutional memory has a lot to do with an anchoring theory, right? California alone, just to replace their high voltage lines and move them down into underground, is one or two trillion dollars. The older we get as value investors, the more we focus on catalysts. Hi, I'm Steve Clapham. Welcome to the Behind the Balance Sheet podcast, where we meet leading investors and commentators and educate ourselves about the world of investing and the world at large. Our mission is to remove some of the mystique around investing and improve our understanding of what makes a successful investment or indeed an unsuccessful one. Our goal is to inform, educate and entertain. We hope you enjoy this and every episode. Behind the balance sheet and affiliates and podcast guests may own shares or have an economic interest in securities discussed in this podcast, which is aired for your education and entertainment only. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as investment advice or relied upon for investment decisions. Always do your own research. Alec Cutler is a value investor who manages a balanced fund based in Bermuda. That fund has been one of the best performing low risk global funds. And Alec has an interesting and pragmatic investing approach. In this interview, we discuss inflation and markets and what this means for stock selection. Alec explains some of his holdings. I groaned when I learned a stock I picked and gave up on years ago has been an eight bagger since. Why do I keep making these mistakes? Alec explains the principles of investing he learned as a child from his grandmother, which still guide his investing framework today. He explains why diverse teams work better and how he matches numbers people with storytellers when they review a stock and why the CFA is simply table stakes. I really enjoyed this discussion, well, apart from that stock mistake, and particularly our exploration of why the 2020s will likely be very different from the 2010s. A number of tailwinds that have been propelling markets in the last 20 plus years, and it's not just interest rates, they're all now becoming headwinds. I've been presenting on this for the last 12 to 18 months at various investment conferences, and I'm thinking perhaps I should do a webinar for podcast listeners. If you're interested, let me know. Email me at info at behindbalancesheet.com. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this episode. And just to emphasize, we recorded it in the summer, and Alex's discussion of stocks is not investment advice. Do your own research. Alec, welcome to the show. I'm so pleased that we finally get to meet in person. And... I always ask the same opening question. Did you always want to be an investor? At least since age seven or eight, when my grandmother started teaching me everything there was to know about investing. So, yes. I love the grandmother stories. We had the very first um, episode of this podcast. We had on Brent Hoberman and John Armitage. Brent's the uh, leading light in UK tech and venture capital. And John manages a $28 billion hedge fund. He's got one of the best track records in the world. But there's this like bizarre connection because Brent's grandmother was one of the early investors in, in John's fund. And John started talking about grandmother. And it, it, the grandmother was obviously a formidable character. And from the sound of it, your grandmother was as well. But you told me this story about, she said, don't buy sugar because you can get the sugar packets for free in, in restaurants. She must have been a wealthy woman. Why did she have this sort of frugality? <laughs> and have you inherited that? I have, but my wife hasn't. Ah, yeah, um, so usual we, problem. Yeah. yeah, I guess. Um, yep, she was she was quite frugal, and she um, she understood value for money. My grandfather had a seat on the New York Stock Exchange, and when he died in the late '60s, when I was three, his partners at Rothschild said, "Well, you will sell this back to us," and she said, "I don't like the price." And they said, but you're a woman. And she said, I don't like the price. So she kept it for another 20 years, leasing it out. So she was, a, she was another tough customer, another tough grandmother. Well, you weren't allowed as a woman to, to own the seat? Not according to our family lore, no. It's quite a, um, 
quite amazing. It was the 60s. I mean, it's not that, I mean, it's long ago, but it's only 50 years ago. Well, I think quite... Muriel Siebert was, um, was shortly after that. So they did break down eventually. And you told me this story about the Charlie's Folly file dedicated to hot stock losses. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, she, she, I think she was a better investor than my grandfather, who was the professional investor. He bought his seat March of 29. Oh, wow. So not exactly the best timing. I think he probably bought pretty high. And, uh, and she was offered a low price and said, no way. Um, it was clear I didn't know what a value investor was back then. But if you add the frugality with the um, sense of value for money and the importance of dividends, the importance of a, um, of a good management team, the importance of buying things for less than they are worth based on cash earnings. These are all things that she was teaching us at seven, eight years old. She was clearly a, a value investor and, and clearly was not afraid to be alone and wrong. And how, how did she learn all this? I mean, the importance of cash earnings. I mean, how would she have known? She learned it at cocktail parties. Classic. Right. So what did you do as a stockbroker back in the back in the 60s, 50s and 60s? You had cocktail parties and you talked about stocks and she listened. And she is one of those classic women of the 50s and 60s and 40s that wasn't allowed to go to school. Education way below her intelligence. And, you know, to make money was a model back in the 50s and 40s when you weren't supposed to be a model. Uh, and she picked up from just the listening to what was going on, became a fantastic investor. And you you mentioned the the importance of of um, good stewards management. What well, what did she teach you about that? Was she did she have any sort of lessons to learn? I mean, they she they lived in New York City, mm -hmm. so she frequented a lot of the management teams back then. If you were a decent sized company, you were headquartered in New York, right. so she knew them personally. And she knew the good ones from the bad ones. And she knew the ones that wore fancy watches and had slick back hair and suspenders and, you know, all the classic sort of <laughs> Wall Street no-nos for um, someone who promoted themselves more than, their, more than their company and their shareholders. So you did a spell in the Navy and then you joined Brandywine. You didn't immediately set out to become an, an investor. Tell us about Brandywine, because that, you were working directly with the founder, and that's now like a $60, $70 billion firm. It's like a yeah. massive firm. So what was that like? That was an opportunity to work with Tony Hitchler. was fantastic. You know, anyone who gave me advice in business school said, work for somebody who is great. If you can find a visionary, make them your mentor. It doesn't matter how much money you make. Work with that person for free and visit them on weekends. Do whatever you can to soak up what they have. Tony Hitchler at that time was one of the top U.S. value investors, deep value. He had nerves of steel, and yet he was a quite emotional person and friendly person. So really interesting mix for, uh, for, a, for a value and deep value investor. So I had a, I had a wonderful experience with Tony and stayed at uh, Brandywine until he left, which was hard because I chafed at the the discipline particularly you had to sell you were allowed to buy anything in the bottom quartile a price to earnings cash flow or book but you had to sell when it reached median and oh that, really okay. yeah and that made zero sense to me from day one mm. that you would do all that work on a contrarian idea like adobe at eight dollars with ten dollars in cash in 1998 and then sell it when it was up 50, 60% and handed off to a growth investor who rides it for 4,000%. So um, I didn't like that. I chafed at that. I tried to create ways around it, but it was a, it was a hard and fast discipline there. Well, why do you think they impose such a rigorous discipline? Because that, I mean, that one of the sort of cardinal rules in investing, equity investing, is you've got to be flexible, right? I mean, why have that straight jacket? But it had worked really well yeah. for decades. If you had done that over decades, and, and Brandywine was a very quant front-end shop, uh, and we did studies and had studies published. And in fact, I, I did a, um, uh, uh, 
a tax-adjusted version of one of the basic value studies at, at Wharton with Jeremy Siegel. And it works extremely well and actually had pretty low vol, so high sharp ratio. Uh, and they run a quant fund on the side that still does quite well. But it's mm -hmm. a lot of turnover. Yes. And I hadn't realized you were at Wharton with Jeremy Siegel. What, who, yeah. what was he like? He was fantastic. Yeah. He is, he's exactly what he's like on TV. <laughs> Oh, I've never seen him on TV. I, I, I'm, no, he's know, on I'm, he's on American TV all the time. He's a big commentator now. But oh, uh, really? Uh, we were uh, we didn't know it at the time, but I suspect that we as grad students were helping him write chapters in his book, Stocks hmm. for the Long Run, which is really the the Bible now. I think for anyone getting into investing. Yeah, well, it's been a pretty popular book. I feel a bit. I feel a bit sort of parochial sitting in London without having an opportunity to watch Jeremy Siegel on the television. But no, never <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you can find him on YouTube, and I'm <laughs> sure you can. I'm sure you can anticipate what he'd say. Oh yeah, I know. I'm, I'm sure. I love that line you told me about that. Um, Tony Hitchler used to come into your office and say, "Great job. This too shall pass." He was obviously uh, quite good at understanding the emotional context. Yeah, and and as a as a contrarian investor, for sure, you know, once you think you're God's gift to investing, you better watch out, because it's about to come down on you, and that's just the nature of the beast. And I mean, you 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 previously had a spell in the navy. I mean, quite a lot of military ex military people seem to do quite well in finance. Why do you think that is? I mean, is it just a discipline thing? I think there's a discipline aspect to it. I think there's a understanding risk. Inherently, mm -hmm. I used to tell people that you know they say, "Why are you so calm dealing with billions of dollars?" And I said, "Well, I've 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 piloted a ship through the Straits of Juan de Fuca with fishing boats all around at night. Like this is nothing compared to that." And I think about my daughter flying jets in the Navy. You know that that's real life and death risk. This this is embarrassment risk. Yeah. We do take our we take our job very seriously. We provide a service. We try and enhance people's savings and wealth. But if we have a bad month or a bad year because the market disagrees with us, it's not the end of the world. That's quite good. That's quite good philosophy. So you you told me that at Brandywine you resisted Warren Buffett's bid for Clayton Holmes. What was that like? Did you get to meet Buffett or did you encounter him? What was he? What was he like being on that? I imagine it's quite formidable being on the other side of the fence. Uh, I, it is. I never. I never got to meet him. He didn't show up at the at the meetings where the votes were counted, but um, it was an incredibly valuable experience. Mostly because I got to know Will and Alan Gray from Orbis, where I am now, and learned um, how such high integrity that 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 firm had and how focused it was on protecting its clients. I mean, it's a vicious defense of clients' rights, and you're not gonna take this company from us type attitude. And um, the fight was, you know, it was a six month long fight. Uh, the vote was delayed at one point because they didn't have the votes, and something magically happened where they were able to get someone to cross the line and, and vote yes, uh, and the, the merger was, was completed. And I think it's been highlighted in, in several of Buffett's reports as having been one of his best investments. Uh, but the real value for, for me was meeting uh, Will and Alan and getting to know the Orbis team. And you lost uh, uh, Clayton Holmes at what, an eight times PE, something like that? Yeah, we were buying, we held it for a couple of years at six, eight times earnings and Buffett paid nine or 10. And I think it's just been a massive win for him. And we knew it was gonna be a massive win, but it's, um, it, it's one of the tough things about deep value investing in particular is some deep pockets can come along and take you out. And that can be for the amount of time and effort you put into it. You know, the 30% pop on that day doesn't feel very good. It's funny it was David Einhorn said exactly the same thing. He bought a stock and it got taken over and he felt that it got taken. It should have been 40% higher. And he said, well, you know, I made 70% or 90%. He said, I just, you know, I didn't have, I, he didn't have the ability to resist, but it, it yeah. was, it's, it's really, really frustrating. You know how good a deal with the other person's 
getting and they aren't being forced to pay up. It must be frustrating. Well, the, the thing that frustrates us most is when we lose, permanently lose capital on something. So, and, and that's, that is, that is an investor behavior that can be quite negative, right? I refuse to sell because I'm down. But if we've done the work and we know the company's going to recover and we bought it at 100, it's sitting at 50. It doesn't deserve to be at 50. It deserves to be at 120. And someone buys it at 70, you've now permanently impaired capital. And that, from a, the way we keep score, that's a loss. No, sure. Well, whichever way you keep yeah. score, that's a loss. But yeah, that's just the, I think that's a reflection of current markets. Mm, yeah. <laughs> So you, you started at Orbis and you moved to Bermuda, which is uh, an, obviously a more pleasant environment than New York. We've had a number of people on the show who work, live in environments which are away from the, the noise. Mm. And we've had sort of slight d debates, discussions. So Chris Pavese, um, of Broyhill Asset Management, um, lives and works in Lenoir. So he works for the Broyhill family, are, are based there. It's the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina. You know, he said, oh, Steve, you must come and visit. It's beautiful. And, and I, I kind of get all that, that it's quiet, it's nice. And But I pointed out to him that, you know, I live in London. And as a global investor, Every large company is going to come through London, you know, if they want to, if they want international investors. So there, oh, there's loads of conferences. These things are optional. You don't have to go. You don't have to get sucked into the noise. You don't have to, to do it, but you have the opportunity to do it. Well, how do you feel? I mean, you're we're in London now, so you obviously you have to travel from Bermuda. I mean, what's the advantage and disadvantages of living in, in Bermuda, living away from the noise. I mean, Bermuda is obviously a big financial center. I mean, well, it was that, Tony Hitchler asked, actually believed that it was important to be away from the noise. So, so we were in Wilmington, Delaware at Brandywine. And, uh, and I found it to be quite valuable. We were on the train line so people could come visit. Bermuda is a wonderful place. People come to visit there too. So we do have management teams come through. And when they do come through, it's special for them and it's special for us. So mm -hmm. it, it means something. It's quality time. It's dinner. It's taking them out on a boat or taking them golfing or finding them a tennis partner to play with. Um, it's a much higher quality experience than when they're doing a road show and they're doing the rote thing. And, you know, we never ask questions anyway. We prefer to, to do things one on one and and off the off the beaten road show path. Um, but beyond that, to to be a contrarian, it seems to help to be removed you know we're expected to try and analyze what's in the box anticipate where the box is going and it's really hard to do that when you're in it yeah i, I get that yeah and we do have a team in london team in san francisco team in hong kong we have uh, cape town we have um we have a lot no so you've got people uh, analysts on the ground so they can um keep keep an eye on what you on what you own and give you some warning signals. I and guess. with technology, we can join any of those meetings from from Bermuda. Yeah, I mean, I, I obviously, we've had a massive change since COVID. And you are able to do to join all the conferences, etc, remotely. But I find it slightly this, I don't know, it's just slightly unsatisfactory. So we we could have had our this conversation over zoom. But it's not, it's not bad, but the quality of, com our, of our conversation is better if we're in person. It's 2D and, versus 3D. Yeah. It's and, an extra dimension. But when you're, when you're talking to a management team and you want to understand, not necessarily that you're expecting them to be lying to you, but there are areas of, of where they're comfortable and obviously there's not an issue and there's areas where they're uncomfortable. And it's just that sense of, oh, obviously, when I start asking about this division, he doesn't, he's worried about this division. And being aware of that, I think, is a huge, huge part of having the one-to-one -one meeting. And I find that just much less satisfactory on Zoom. Yeah, and we'd rather just skip straight to going to visit the company. Yeah. Because, the, the, you know, when you go to a presentation, they've practiced that. It's been vetted through the lawyers. 
there's no body language because they practice it 50 times and they've been told body body language expert not to do this and this. When you go to visit them at their company headquarters, which I'm doing on Monday and Tuesday out in Birmingham, you know, those are valuable experiences we find. And you can get the you can get the entire management team, especially if they're down. I mean, I had the opportunity as a young analyst to go meet Adobe, and they were so pummeled that the two founders showed up to the meeting. It was a one-hour meeting. I spent three hours with them. They told me everything there was to know about Acrobat, which they were just, just putting out, and the FDA had just signed a release saying that any drug submissions had to be done over Acrobat. And at that time, Adobe was thought to be a dead company, that oh, Apple really? was going to kill them. Yeah. How funny. Yeah. Apple and Microsoft were going to kill them, and there's Adobe signing a massive contract with the government. The, in those days, of course, they could tell you that. They wouldn't. They it was wouldn't a publicly release, release oh. that no one cared about. Oh, really? Yes. God, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. That's astonishing. So, um, and presumably, when you go and see companies, they're like, oh, man, we've got an investor coming to see us. Because you're buying all the stuff that nobody else wants, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're the friendly face, usually. Usually. <laughs> so, listen, um, we've been talking about the the sort of we're at an inflection point. We share this sort of perspective that we've had forty years of falling rates, and I've I've been doing a presentation. I, I've done it twice in the last month um, to private investors conferences. Just. Um, and I, I can't remember what the title of it is. It's something like, why you need to look back 100 years to look forward 10. Not mm -hmm. very catchy, but the, the idea... it can save you a lot of money. Mm? Because it can save you a lot of money. Well, I, I mean, what I've just said is, look, it's not just 40 years of falling rates. You've had cheap, plentiful labor. You've had globalization, China. You've had cheap energy. You've had technological innovation. Peace dividend. You've had demographics, you've had the Berlin Wall, <laughs> you know, you could go on and on and on. And what I do, actually, is I've got this slide, which is, let's, let's go back 100 years. And so I've got a picture of a Tesla and a picture of a, a center door, a Model T Ford. And say, so let's pretend we're in 1923. And the, the data point is actually 1921. But you know, I, I, I'm still do, using the same slide. And um, if you were in 1921 and you look back 50 years, do you know, I mean, can you guess how many months were bear markets, how many months were, were bull markets? I mean, it, the, the number is astonishing. So there were 412 months of bear market and 180 months of bull markets. And people seem to be conditioned this idea that the stock market goes up at 8% forever. I mean, I just read a book by Nick Maggiuli, which, I mean, it's not a bad book, but th this seems to be like a given. So the stock market's going to go up at 8%, so you need to get your money in now. And Buffett, in a way, has been encouraging this perspective. And I've been saying, well, it's possible that that's not going to happen for the next 10, 20, 30, I, I don't know how many years. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what did you, what's your take on all that? Uh, we think you're spot on. And, um, you know, we study human nature a lot in this, in this business, either formally or informally. And the institutional memory has a lot to do with an anchoring theory, right? So whatever has been is what you expect. And the, the first blip in a regime change is ignored completely or is a by the, by the dip, by the dip, by the dip, which has been working great. But if you look at, the, at what's stacked up against us after 40 years of what's been a tailwind, it's pretty ominous and, and impressive. And when I speak to that, I get a lot of nods. And then I suspect people go back to, they see CNBC or something and they get pulled up again. But what's really underlying it, it appears, is just a tremendous amount of liquidity in the market mm. and stimulus. And that also appears to be something that people are getting used to. Yep. So there's an addiction to stimulus and money being pushed into financial assets and the economy. You know, we talk about how it used to be called helicopter money. Um, and now it's just, it's actually really happening. 
And I think if the if the Fed, you know, look back in the in the seventies, and um, everyone gave Arthur Burns credit for being an idiot and creating the disaster that was the seventies. But if you look back to the seventies, you would say that the the thing that threw everything off was was going off the gold standard in 1971. That threw Arthur Burns for a loop because yeah. there go your guardrails. I suspect if we look back in 10 or 15 years and the decade, this decade is winds up being awful or the next decade winds up being awful, I think we'll look back and see during COVID the Fed, the Federal Reserve Bank pleading with the government to stimulate and spend money and give money away will be that 1971 gold standard moment in that they, the government has never been told by the Fed to spend money. The, the Fed was the, was the adult in the room, right? <laughs> and then they said, spend money. And how long did it take the government to spend $7 billion? Seven, sorry, trillion dollars. <laughs> Chump change, billions. <laughs> $7 trillion in a few months. And then we had the Inflation Reduction Act that quickly followed thereafter, which was another two or three trillion when, when all is said and done. The, the economy is addicted to money. The market's addicted to money. It's going to be interesting to see to what degree the Fed can follow through on quantitative tightening because every time they seem to tighten, something blows up. Yeah. Like the regional banks. And uh, we have a big debate in our shop, and we are not economists or strategists. We kind of eschew that that pursuit. Uh, we are stock pickers and, and bond pickers. But we do have to go to 50,000 feet every once in a while and say, what the heck's going on? And when we do that, we look at the cycle of, you know, the, the Republicans just approving another $4 trillion in, um, in deficit spending and looking at the Federal Reserve saying, well, you'll buy that, right? <laughs> you'll buy those <laughs> bonds, right? And then how does that not inflate the Federal Reserve's balance sheet? So we just don't see how we're going to get out of the cycle. And then the question is, well, maybe we can go to infinity on the cycle of, of, of liquidity. And the only thing we keep coming up with is inflation. Yeah. The bond vigilantes can't compete with the Fed. You know, no one has, no one with a 50 leverage can do can do something about $4 trillion in bond buying from the Fed. So it has to come out in inflation somehow. Mm -hmm. No, I think that I think that's right. But I'm curious that you say you eschew the pursuit of um, looking at the economic strategy because, I mean, you're running a balanced fund. So you're doing, you yeah. know, you, I mean, how can you not spend a lot of your time if you're investing in bonds? I mean, I, I, I'm not familiar with with you know people that invest in government bonds really i mean you know i've worked with people that did 60 40 and always thought it was pointless but if you're if you are going to look at government bonds then surely you need to be a bit of an economist don't you i mean we have a currency team mm -hmm. and if you think about what a currency team is they're really government economists sure uh they advise us on currencies if you want to place a bet on a currency you buy the government bond we also have um, two very experienced fixed income portfolio managers mm -hmm. on our directly on our nine person team. Where we make our asset allocation, however, is bottom up. So we force our fixed income ideas to compete against equity ideas. We force them to compete against gold or a commodity. Right. We compete all of those to compete against hedged equity. So higher risk equity with um, with the market hedged. And then we can do currency overlays on top of that. So it looks like a very confusing ball of spaghetti. Um, and you know, there were people that said you can't really do asset allocation that way. But we have now for 11 years, and it's worked just fine. When you I'll give you an example, why in the world would you buy a US 10 year at 3.74%? At no inflation protection with a, a seven years of duration risk when you can buy a Kinder Morgan and get a 7% dividend that's inflation protected. All the contracts are inflation linked. All their counterparties are A rated, 90% are A rated. And uh, they have a 12% free cash flow yield. So dividend well covered 
run by Rich Kinder, one of the visionary legends in energy investing. They rent out natural gas pipelines. The business for natural, pipe, natural gas pipelines looks pretty darn good. Mm. Kinder, I'm not going to buy a, a U.S. 10-year when I can buy Kinder Morgan. So just an example of how an equity can compete against a But, I mean, bond. presumably you've got to have some 10-year U.S. Treasuries or some dur- duration of U.S. Treasuries just to give you a balance in the in overall portfolio, or can you go 100% equity? No, we can we can go up to 75% net equity. Yeah, we've averaged around 63. Okay, so not far off a 60/40, and we've made up that what we're dedicated to is making a moderate risk portfolio. Mm-hmm. As we saw in 2022, having 40% of your portfolio in 10-year bonds wasn't a moderate risk portfolio. And we've been screaming about that for years. We've been calling fixed income reward-free risk. And in 2020, you had 20% of the bonds in the world had negative yields. Like, how is that protecting you to the downside in your equities? Um, So we put a ton of flexibility in our our mandate such that at that time, we could be, you know, a slug of gross equities 20% 20% hedged, 10% in gold, in gold miners, and 10, 15% in short dated bonds and tips. So you just go very short dated in the government yeah. securities and, and inflation protected. Yeah. And we weren't giving up much in, in the way of yield going short dated. You know, you're, you were getting 50 basis points instead of 100. Yeah. Well, the, the, so 100 you, basis points for seven years of duration risk. That It was insane. Yeah. No. I, Although, I mean, presumably now the, the balance is better. Yes, it is. And we're moving it up a bit. Most of it's in tips, though. Because if you look at where the inefficiency is in the market, and I know you don't want to get too short term, but I think this is actually a long-term statement. Inflation expectations are way too low. And I don't understand, well, I do understand the psychology behind hope, <laughs> but you've had a you've had a Federal Reserve Bank, and I won't comment on the Bank of England or the ECB. I know the Federal Reserve better, but they haven't been right on anything for years, and yet they have everyone convinced that we're going back to two percent inflation. So inflation expectations out ten years or as far as we look is for us to go back to two percent inflation on average over the next ten years. That's starting now. Yeah. It's starting a year ago. It's starting a year before that. We're well into the point in time where the Fed said we'd be back at 2%. And they just keep moving the line and moving the line, and people keep believing and believing it. Don't know when they're going to stop believing that, but if you own tips, you don't really care. So we're getting one point between 1.6 and 2% nominal on the tips, plus inflation. So the bond is paying us on a, on a quarterly basis at 1.6 to 2%, plus we get all the accumulated inflation between now and maturity. We're betting that that's gonna, that inflation is going to be more than 2%. Well, I hope you're enjoying this episode. And if so, you're bound to enjoy our free newsletter on Substack. It's a weekly email I send out each Sunday morning on interesting investing-related topics. Just visit BehindTheBalanceSheet.com and hit that little sign-up button on the top right. And while you're there, you should check out our fabulous online investor training school. Hundreds of students have taken our flagship Analyst Academy course, which teaches you everything you need to become a serious equity investor. And if you're a professional investor, we also run a forensic accounting course for institutional clients and a cohort-based course for smaller funds and for serious amateurs. Email me at info at behindthebalancesheet.com for more information. I think that's a pretty reasonable bet. I mean, it's quite it's quite funny, isn't it? Because um, I mean, you can you can see some of the data points do indicate that underlying inflation is coming down in the in the United States, but common sense tells you that we can't go back to the period that we've just come through, because it's, inflation seems to be pretty endemic. I mean, I know, I know so particularly here in London and food costs. So I think we've got something like 19% inflation in, in food here. Yeah, I should add it's for awful. the benefit of the listeners that we're recording this at the last week in, or second last week of June, just to, just to timestamp that because obviously these things are, are moving around 
quite a lot. I mean, if you sort of looked at sort of five years, I mean, where do you think inflation might be? Don't know, but I think the odds are it's going to be higher than 2%. Yeah. So we can, you know, if you're, the biggest worry about the future has to be inflation. Sure. You can throw global conflict in there because that looks pretty scary too, mm. especially when you have a daughter in the military, uh, but which is also inflationary. But inflation's a killer, and everyone knows that. It comes from different places at different times. So we have all of these um, central bankers trained doing their doctoral thesis on the, on the 1970s. But inflation's not going to pop up in the same way every time. And if you look at that layer cake that you went through of inflationary impulses, of tailwinds that have become headwinds, and then you add on greenflation. So Jeremy Grantham came out and put a price tag on greenflation at $100 trillion we need to spend to get to net zero. And he's a fan of getting to net zero. $100 trillion, the U.S. GDP is $30 trillion, I think. This is a massive number. People... <laughs> People lose, a con lose the concept of what a trillion is. And I, at conferences, I ask people, if you go back in time a trillion seconds, what year are you in? And I get some, I get some answers that aren't even close, but it's 30,000 BC. A trillion is a big, big number. It's a big number, number yeah. And that, um, that inflationary impulse alone that's going to come from electrifying everything is just immense. And we're starting to see some bulking at that. So it may be fast, it may be slow, but that layer cake of inflationary impulses is just too big to ignore. And the, the $100 trillion, just to be clear, is inflationary because it's not creating any incremental output. It's simply to replace assets that we already got. And, and if we didn't have a problem with, with the climate, then we wouldn't necessarily need to replace those assets. But it's reducing output. So if you were, the, the example I like to give is your, um, you're going, to re you're going to force the cement factory to replace the heating part of cement, which is how you make turn limestone into cement. You get it really hot. Um, you have to replace um, oil, coal, or natural gas with electricity. That's being mandated. If it was more efficient to heat that up with electricity, we would have done it to begin with. <laughs> yes, of course. So yeah. we're shifting from a, from a more efficient cheaper way to make cement to a more expensive way. That doesn't reduce prices. That increases prices. Plus, you have to amortize the billion dollars that it takes to change over from natural gas to electricity. I don't know what we're going to make our roads from. But if, but if tarmac, which is made from oil, is the, is the cheapest way to make a road, I, I'm pretty certain that it's going to be more expensive to maintain our roads unless we're going to just drive on, go back to gravel and dirt. Well, we might be doing less driving. Maybe. And we'll all be, I, my theory is we'll all be in little autonomous cars, so... Well, know, maybe we'll have flying cars. And we'll have, of course, we'll have the flying cars. I'm sure. What they'll... happened? Well, I mean, they were all the rage in just a couple of years ago. I haven't heard, I haven't seen any flying cars. All the specs. Well, you have to burn a lot of coal to charge them up. It's, um, this whole greenflation thing, though, I think is, is really a fascinating subject. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm with Jeremy Grantham. You know, we need, to, we need to do this because our children need to have a, a planet to, mm -hmm. to, to live on. But the, the, the whole ESG thing has been hijacked by people in finance in order it to has. make money. It's, I, I mean, it's a big I think, marketing game now. Yeah, it's just extraordinary. And, and this, this idea that... Yeah, of course, you can invest in things that will benefit from the $100 trillion of spend, but the underlying picture will be one of a more inflationary environment. And why do you think people don't understand that equities don't necessarily protect you against inflation? Because, uh, I mean, if we go back to the 70s, mm -hmm. equities were rubbish. I mean, except for really cheap ones, except for small really cap cheap and ones. value did quite well. Yeah. Small cap and value did well. What, what um, I mean, what do you think will do well this time? I, I mean, it won't, it, will it necessarily be the same, same thing? 
it feels like it's going to be, I, I call them advanced industrials, so AI, <laughs> the, the other AI. But if you think about um, where we're headed, we need to completely rebuild the grid. The European and, and North American grids are on average 40 years old. The design life is 20 to 25 years for high voltage cabling. And if we're going to, and we're completely reorienting it, when you yeah. put EV charging points everywhere and you put windmills, windmill fields and solar fields, solar farms, 500 miles away from the coal plant, you're going to close down. You need to completely reorient the grid or the wires melt. And that's what's happening. So you need to completely rewire everything. That is trillions. California alone, just to, just to harden, just to replace their high voltage lines and move them down into underground, is one or two trillion dollars. California alone. And that's where you, they're the case point. California and Texas are the places where the fires are starting because the, the lines are overheating and sagging and they sag down into a tree and they are uncovered so they start a fire. But the, the shot is across the bow that the, the, ne the grid networks, the electricity that we're banking all of our greening on are decrepit and need to get replaced. So you can make, we have, a, we have a significant investment in the companies that facilitate that change that has to happen. So there's, there's one odd thing that's happening right now. People are worried about a recession. We've been baking in a recession now for over a year. And cyclicals have kind of been treading water because mm. they're waiting for the recession to be called so that people can buy them because that's the way it works. And um, construction is, is typically a high beta economic cyclical, right? But we have to spend so much money on, on, on greening everything, on electrifying every process. Add to that the onshoring that's happening. Onshoring's already happening. No one waited for the IRA to get subsidies. People have been pulling out of China for quite a while and moving things back to the US and, and, uh, and Canada and Mexico and the UK. That money's being spent and that is, you can't just plop a factory down somewhere. That has a road, that has a port extension, that has an addition to the airport, that has a rail service, uh, all that, all the infrastructure has to happen. And if it's not done by commercial means, it's going to be done by the government via subsidy, via cash. Well, I mean, the construction numbers are off the charts in the mm -hmm. U.S. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've forgotten what the number is, but I, the, I, I've got the picture of the chart in my mind. I mean, I, I was ast astounded. I mean, there, there's no, not even a sign of a recession. I mean, I don't know. Not in construction. I mean, obviously, the U.S. is a consumer, 70% consumer, so we can have a recession in construction going up. But, um, but the U.K. has cranes all over it as well. Balfour Beatty has the biggest bookings they've ever had. It's Well, most of its competitors have gone bust. I mean, that's part, <laughs> that, part that does of, help. Part it helps when you're the one well-managed one. Yeah, that, that helps. The capital cycle, which we always always like. The, the, the infrastructure, the, the grid... Um, plays. I mean, what what was the company that you were referring to? Because it always it used to be ABB was the one that people always cited. And, you know, it was a it, it was never a very good stock. I mean, never really. I mean, we, we I have been played around in it and made made some money in it. But it should have been like, you know, one of these long term quality compounders. And it yeah. just never kind of fulfilled that promise. Are, are there others that you that you like? Yeah. So I I think um, maybe I'll be one of your one of your only guests to mention a European success story. Go on, <laughs> we like the, to hear it. Hear the those. electric cable was a terrible business for a long time. Mm. You built you built out the U.S., you built out Europe, and then what do you do? So um, that that business went into negative growth for decades. Mm. The Europeans bought all the American high voltage, medium voltage cable companies, cable manufacturers. So all of the Western world, if you will, is being supplied by three European companies. The old Pirelli, which is now called Prismian, uh, NKT in the Netherlands, 
and Nexons in France, they are, they're virtually 100% of the high voltage cable that now is in extremely high demand. Siemens Energy makes the transformers and switches. And they make the, that by the way, when they did, when Siemens um, spun out Siemens uh, Energy, because they want to get out of this dirty energy business, industrial stuff, they didn't even feature their grid equipment division in the in the roadshow materials. <laughs> they talked about gas turbines, which um, was thought to be in permanent decline. Now the EU has decided that that's the transition fuel, and we're moving to hydrogen. So gas turbines are going to be around forever, uh, taking the taking the excess energy from the from the windmills and solar plants, converting it into hydrogen, and then burning the hydrogen when they've when it's dark and cold and no wind. Um, in the U.S., Maztec, we own. I followed. I followed a company called Quanta forever, and they've become the the darling of um, transmission line development. Uh, but Maztec is a much cheaper version of that. They are about a third transmission line engineering and construction, and um, a third um, windmills and solar, and a third natural gas pipelines, which we have a contrarian bullish view on. Quanta was another disappointing stock that I played around with. It was, a, it, it was the one that does the, the poles, wasn't it? And part of the, I remember mm -hmm. part, of the, part of the business was erecting new, new uh, transmission poles. And, yep. like, and that construction part of the business was never a, high, never a particularly high quality business, I it's guess. It's extremely high quality now. Is it? Um, it's, a, it's a 40 multiple. You'd be oh, you're joking. very depressed to know that it's up about 500% in the last three years. Oh, really? Because it's one, I, I, you know, I did a spell helping uh, a wealth manager in London with their international equity portfolio. And then they ended up asking me to run some money for some of their private clients. And, um, I just, it, it's just a part-time thing, which I, I, I'm not keen in the idea of, of doing equities part-time because mm -hmm. I think it's a 100% full-time yeah. Or nothing job but um but the the quanta was you know exactly the the play on this uh, opportunity and um i got i got that one wrong because the, you know it had some problem with the contract and of course it just, you got it early I yeah mean, that it's is early or late or wrong they're usually the same thing right i mean but we've been looking at this problem I've been looking at this problem for 15 years. Yeah. We've been past the design life on these lines for 15 years. And every year it gets a year worse. Quanta was a, was an obvious play on it. And, you know, we can't control when the market rec recognizes value. No, but you you don't get paid to wait around for 15 years. I mean, that's the, I mean at the end of the day, you, you can be early. And, you know, if you're running a very big fund, then you kind of got to be early because if you're late, you mm. you 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 end up pushing the price against yeah. you, and and it's very difficult to 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 make money. But you can't be too early, and I think a lot of people, a lot of analysts in particular, you know, say, "Well, I'm right. You know, I'm going to be proved right." But I don't think that's the right philosophy. You need to buy the stock at the right time. I'm not saying that you need to time it to the minute, but mm. you can't you can't be a, a year or two early because. Especially if you if you run into trouble along the way, as, yes. as I did with as I did with that. Yeah, the market can stay crazy longer than you can stay liquid. Well, you know, I, it's just you know one one more of a, to add to the long list of my in, investing mistakes. But it, it's it's not really any comfort at all to know that it's gone up five. No, and, you know, we the older the older we get as value investors, the more we focus on catalysts for that reason. And now you can see, you can see the age of the network, and you can see the catalyst. We're going to electrify. Electricity is the is the solution to all our problems. Oh, of course, of course. Now, I was reading um, a, a, a sort of transcript of something that Stanley Druckenmiller said, and I thought it was really brilliant. I'm going to read it to you. <clears throat> so this was on June the seventh, um, so two weeks ago. And he said, there's a 500 year history of asset bubbles well documented in The Price of Time, which Edward Chancellor's book, which I haven't yet read. But um, 
basically it documents, and I'd already known about the, the, this one about the last 100 years, but it's going out 500 years. Every time you've had a significant asset bubble, economic trouble lay ahead. When you had 11 years of free money, people do stupid things. All you have to do is look at how someone paid $80 billion for a dodgy coin. I don't know how to pronounce it which was invented as a joke. That can only happen in the world of free money. It also suppressed people worrying about the kind of stuff I just talked about, because you keep rates at zero. But the fact that this was arguably the most disruptive economic period we've had since the late 1800s, and there were no bankruptcies, tells me there's a lot of stuff under the hood. Now, I've been writing about the problems stored up in private credit and in private equity. Do you... I know that you agree with that bubble stuff. Talk about what the consequences of, of the free money and the daft um, valuations have been or will be. Yeah, so, I mean, free money and daft valuations, we could also term misallocation of capital. Yeah. And a misallocation of capital uh, does bad things to the economy. It has, you, it has you investing in things that you want but don't need. It has you not investing in things you need, but don't give a crap about, like where copper comes from. Um, and then the, the result of that invariably is inflation. You have more money chasing less, less inputs. And we've seen that, and people have blown it off as uh, it's a COVID effects and supply chain disruption and things like that, and maybe there's, maybe there's some of that. But, um, there's just been a lot of wasted money around and then that creates inflation and then the, the central banks freak out and they clamp down. The biggest worry I have, so inflation's a worry. The biggest worry as a portfolio manager I have with the portfolio that, I've, that I'm in charge of and my team runs and has created that we consider to be moderate risk is that the Fed actually really does believe that 2% is the right number and that they have to get there or they will be pilloried and they won't be able to go to the country club when they retire. And they can do it eventually. If you push hard enough, if you crush the economy enough, you can get there. That will be robbing from the poor to preserve the rich for one but it would be it would be disastrous and what i'm worried about is that layer, all those layer cakes of of inflationary impulses these 700 economists sitting in the federal reserve building that have fancy degrees either don't see or don't believe or whatever i have no confidence in them now that they that they just keep raising rates in order to crush down to 2% if the natural rate of inflation for the next 15 years is 5 and you're crushing to 2 you have to completely destroy the economy. And then you destroy the economy, you get what you you get what you finally were looking for, you get deflation, you get a depression, and then you shove a bunch of mon bunch more money back in. Um, and I just think that would be awful for the world, awful for the economy, awful for um, for social conflict. Um, we could be in an awful state created by the world central banks who somehow agreed in Vienna or something at some random time years ago that 2% was the right number. But they were, I mean, they're, they're not wedded, handcuffed to the 2%. Are they? I mean, I, I think they're, you know, the, the, well, the, 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 the risk of error obviously lies on them giving too much money away because, you know, that's politically palatable. Mm. So I, I don't share your concern. I think, though, you know, if we're if four or five percent inflation, I mean, four percent sounds better than five. Four percent inflation, I think, it would be quite manageable. And historically, it, it's and, been manageable. Yeah, and it's been you know things have been fine, mm -hmm. and you just make sure that you get paid four percent more every year, and 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 that that's okay. And I think if they start putting people out of work in order to get inflation below 4%. I mean, there's no, they're not going to, that's not a vote winner. No. So I don't, I, I'm, I'm more relaxed about that. I'm just trying to think through what happens if it's not, I mean, four or five is fine, yeah. but how do you get to four or five? And what happens if it's eight and eight isn't that great? 
and could be could be very very painful. Uh, I mean, do you, do you have a sort of scenario that says you know I think there's an, a ten percent probability of two and a thirty percent probability of four or no? We we just go where the market leads us. So what is the what is the market giving us? The market is giving away high free cash flow, high dividend yielding, really good companies that have bright futures regardless of what variant of economic activity we have. The market just doesn't care about those names. Those are short duration. And there and tips are being given away. Those are relatively short duration relative to nominal bonds. And that's what the market's telling us to own. We can create all kinds of economic scenarios where that winds up being okay. Uh, even an economic scenario where we go, we we gracefully go down to two percent or zero and back to two, uh, and we have um, quantitative tightening. Those names will do just fine. So why why are these good companies being overlooked? What what what's the issue? Is it just there's no value investors around? I mean, the, the well, David Einhorn is very eloquent about this, and he and you know, my my philosophy when I was at the hedge funds was to do special situations and, you know, to buy stocks where for whatever reason the market had got the earnings wrong, that when the earnings come through, they're much higher than people thought. The stock not only gets a lift from the earnings, it, it gets re-rated. And those sorts of things you can make 50, 60, 70 percent. Yeah. Einhorn says, well, you can't do that anymore because there's nobody left to buy them. That's right. So do, you, do you share that? I, increasingly, I do, and it's um, it can be depressing, but we can react to that. Mm. So you know, I'm visiting these companies on Monday and Tuesday. I'm going to talk to them about dividends. So we can get paid. If I'm getting paid in dividend, I'm okay to wait, and be patient, and and wait around for what I hope doesn't happen, and that is we resort to venture capital showing up and buying up these, all these lovely um, smaller British companies that have great free cash flow and they're really well well run. So that may wind up being a, a catalyst that, um, you know, it's not going to work with a with a DuPont or a Westlake chemical, but it can work with a Headlam or a Victoria PLC here in the in the UK. Um, and then we can do a better job, I think, as value investors in getting the word out. And how do you do that? I mean, other than going in podcasts. You know. <laughs> That's it. I mean, going out and just telling people, doesn't this look crazy? Yes, it does. Why don't you buy it? See, there I don't like the idea of talking about stocks in the podcast because yeah. it then it then makes the podcast have a very much shorter shelf life. Yeah. Whereas I, you know, ideally I want to have longer. But is it is interesting to talk about stocks? But Einhorn is buying stocks where they're buying the shares back, and he says, "Well, you know, I'll be the last man." I own, yeah, the whole, no, no I own the whole thing, right? Yeah. Which I, which is fine because if they've got, you know, enough cash flow and sensible balance sheet, that, that's fine. But I suppose he has to do that because he's more U.S. oriented, and the U.S. don't like dividends. Yeah. really. I mean, which it's is thirty percent withholding tax. Yeah. Well, we've got withholding tax as well. I mean, but people, I don't know. Our our whole equity um, investing space is dominated by de by dividends. Mm. UK equity income funds. I mean, there's a, a hundred different UK equity income funds, and basically they all own Shell and Rio, and they've they've, they've been doing quite well yeah. recently. Um, but I mean, you think dividends are an important part of your investing philosophy, and I'm in interested to talk about that with you because I've never really worried about dividends. I mean. You know, people talk about dividend yield, mm -hmm. and I've I, actually what the dividend yield is. I mean, the dividend's a completely discretionary number, and as you saw with Shell, it can be unchanged from 1945 for 75 years, and then it's gone. Aggravatingly, and, yes. Yeah, and so I don't really like investing on the basis of dividend yield. I teach in my courses. You know, I do these online courses. I say, well, look. The dividend yield is not a valuation measure, right? You don't you don't want to factor that in. The dividend, I mean, it's quite nice to get some dividends, but it doesn't really matter because you can always sell a portion of your holding. It doesn't matter. So don't 
worry about the dividend, but you like dividends. And one of the things I've been th- I've been thinking about in an inflationary environment mm-hmm. is that dividends actually might become more important. I think they do. Yeah. Well, one my grandmother told me they were important. Oh well. So just go with it. Seriously, it um, it it forces discipline on managements. It reminds them that they have owners. And as an owner, I mean, if if I were to buy any company outright, I'd want to get some cash flow from it as the owner from what's in excess of their needs to to grow healthily. So if a, if a company of ours has has growth prospects that are fantastic, good for the good for you, cut the dividend and, and, and do as I would do, do as I would do if I were if you were to ask me and you said you had this great opportunity, then yeah, go for it. But we're in a much more mature world where that's not the case for a lot of companies. So they can either build up cash, they can buy shares back. But remember, a lot of these companies are now small cap. So I think Einhorn's really referring to companies that have significant market values. But if Headlam was to go out and start buying back their shares aggressively, what are they going to be? It may literally be one share left that's worth 250 million pounds. But that's, that is a, to me, that's an end game. That's a take private, effectively. Mm. And I'd rather see an equity culture return to the UK and have, have the stock double or triple because the UK now has a decent equity culture. And you know, the other thing that we can do as an investment firm is lobby the government to try and recreate the equity culture. And you know, in that respect, the government, I think it was in 2001, incenting all the pension plans to go to LDI was not great for the UK equity market. They own 50% of every company. Now they own two. Awful. Well, I mean, the government's, I mean, we had this uh, amazing position and the government's completely screwed it up. I mean, I I was talking to a friend of mine who's IR for one of the big FTSE 100 companies. And he said, you know, they've got hardly any analysts following them because MIFID too has meant that nobody's got money to pay for research. Mm-hmm. And guess what? People don't provide research for free. So the, I had a friend who, who was head of research at one of the bulge bracket firms, and he said, you know, when one of my really good analysts comes in and says, I've got an offer from a hedge fund, don't even, there's no debate, I'm going. He would go, oh no, so that's you know that's another notch down in the II survey. And then he would look and he'd say, but you know I can put that junior in in that in that seat. And oh man, I'm going to save this in my budget because his budget was shrinking every year. And it was, I mean, he's not. He said it was it was like an awful job. But the whole method has completely undermined our whole stock market. Yes. And and you know I don't know I don't know what the I don't know what the end game is, whether everybody just goes and decamps to America because they got a higher multiple or, I mean... That could happen. That could happen. The, the VCs hope. can bring them there. Oh, but I, the, the um, you know, when Mifid came in, we saw that as a, as a wonderful thing for us because we have our own analyst teams. We do our own work. We don't read much Wall Street work. But it's, but it's also, it's come back to hit us. It's boomeranged back in lower and lower volumes. Yeah, and no one caring. So we can scream about a, a a neglected small cap all we want, but we're just shouting into the into the ether. But I mean, presumably these prices will rectify themselves over time because enough, you know, if they get cheap enough, enough people will just put their own money to work. Enough people will go out and train themselves, go to a well-known online school, <laughs> yeah. and, and learn how to yeah. learn how. Well, I've been saying so. I've been saying this to people. You know, I say, I've been saying, look, there's no more. N- there's no point in buying an ETF now, because you're buying all the rubbish of not all the rubbish, but you're buying all the most highly valued stocks that everybody knows about. And you're not buying any of the really lowly valued cheap stocks that are going to make you the money. Mm-hmm. So you've kind of, if you want to protect your wealth in an inflationary environment, what you need to do is you need to learn how to invest. It's fun. And it's fun. Yeah. And you live there. So I, I went to a wedding in, in um, Hull and I talked to a guy and he happened to be a rug distributor, a rug um, layer. 
And I asked him about Headlam, and he said, fantastic company. Really like those guys. Did you invest in, do you own their stock? No, never thought of that. I don't do that kind of thing. This is, this is like pure Peter Lynch, invest in what you know. But no. Well, I think we don't have the same culture of investing as in this country as you, as you do in the United States. I mean, there, there's, a, there's definitely a massive difference. I mean, we, I mean we, obviously, we don't have a Berkshire Hathaway, but even if we did, I doubt that we would have the, the following. I, and it was, it was really, I mean, I, you know, I went to Omaha in, in May for the first time, and I had a brilliant time. I was really struck by the the volume of people and the number of people. And, and I went to a dinner. And that's with value out of favor. Yeah. I mean, it's a real zoo when value's been in favor for four or five years. Well, I, I suppose it's just become a more popular thing and there's a lot of events around it. But I went to a value investing <laughs> dinner um, in aid of Columbia University. So Mario Gabelli sponsors, yeah. the, provides the food. And, there were 300 or something people in the room. And I was, I was really surprised the number of young people, students, and number of women. Because, you know, one of the, one of the issues that we have with the podcast is not, we don't have enough women listeners. And, um, you know, investing is it's a brilliant job if you're a woman, but not that many women do it. Do you have any women in your team? 40%. Yes. 40%. So you got nine people, four women. Yes. Oh, cranky. Yeah, we're doing well. And that, why is that? Uh, we made it an effort, and it's not so that we can pat ourselves on the back. It's because that diversity is critical. Not everyone thinks the same. And clearly, not every woman thinks the same either. No. <laughs> but, um, or man. Uh, it's just been, it's been a wonderful thing. It enhances the conversation and, and arguments. So how do you how do you engineer a diverse team? What are your what are your secrets? We make a big effort to go find the people that we want. And but you're in Bermuda. I mean, it's a quite a small gene pool. <laughs> <laughs> we um, we go very far afield. So three out of um, nine people on the team are South African, for instance. Oh really? Yes. So you've recruited from more of us than the parent. Yes, Alan Gray in uh, in South Africa. Well, that's quite, that's quite interesting. And and how do people find it moving from South Africa to Bermuda? I can't imagine a bigger contrast. I'll just say they love it. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> how about that? But um, it is, it is a, you know, every place has its things, and um, uh, but we haven't. People seem to want to stay. So, and, but you also uh, talk about personality types and you talk about what was you, you said you talked about numbers focused or storyteller investors yes now how do you how do you know when you interview somebody what they are no idea it doesn't come out for a little while but some people what you're referring to is what we and and this isn't when we set out to, to create a truly diverse team we didn't really know what the benefits would be because I haven't seen a truly diverse investment team before so I don't really know um, but one of the one of the first benefits we found were some people are much more dialed into the numbers mm -hmm. and some people are dialed into the story they want to tell the narrative that's how they think that's how their imagination works and we work on stocks together as a team quite often in, in part to bring those two different um, diverse ways of looking at the same problem to bear on the same problem. And it's, it's produced some, I think, I think it's enhanced our process considerably. So, uh, to, so let's say that we decide that we're going to, in spite of the fact it's gone up five, four, we're going to look at Quanta. What, how does the process work? Do you give it to two people or to one person? Uh, how does it, it, it may be one person and a mentor. Mm -hmm. And the, the two of them may be on different sides of that story and numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, or if we're moving really quickly, I might take the story. I might take the narrative and say, you know, this is the theme and this is how it plays into the theme and this is their place in the, in, in the world. Um, and Mark might focus on the, on the cash flow. Um, and someone else might focus on management just to get it done quickly. And how do you coordinate if there's three of you looking at the same stock? We're all in the same place. 
We're all in Bermuda. So it's quite easy. And then you would have a meeting, say, over Zoom with the company just to save time or, with the three of you. Or visit, yeah. Or visit, okay. Ideally visit. I mean, where Bermuda is a, is a very, is a wonderful airport. You can get anywhere from Bermuda. Oh, really? You can get to five gateway cities in the U.S. from which you can fly just about anywhere because you're flying into JFK and Logan and you fly into Heathrow. So we can, uh, and the flight to Heathrow is six hours. Oh, that's not too bad. New York's an hour and a half. So you, the team does a lot of travel. We're recovering. <laughs> you know, we're still, it's taken a while to get out of the COVID mode. Eh? It's, you not only have to be willing to travel, but you have to be willing, the companies have to be willing to talk to you. And it's actually gotten them uh, a little, taken them a little while to get comfortable yeah. with that. Now I'd say we're full bore. All right. Yeah. So what, what does that mean? I mean, how many weeks a year would somebody be on the road? The more the better. Oh, but, really? Yeah. Yeah. Six, eight, maybe. And how do you manage that if they're traveling and them being part of the team and keeping on top of things? I mean, nine people is quite a big team, right? So, yeah, that's where technology is wonderful. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I started out as a tech analyst and a utility analyst at the same time. Oh, really? Uh, mm -hmm. But I, looking at the advances in tech and how they have helped us be efficient, how they've helped us not be efficient, social media, um, you know, the communication sides of things has been fantastic. And, you know, what does it take to become a successful contrarian PM? So you talk about the, you know, having good foundations and you, you like your people to have, have the CFA. I mean, I don't really understand why because the CFA seems to me just like an exercise in box ticking. It's a, you know, it's, yeah, I can endure this punishment, but it's yeah. not very good for learning about analysis. Yeah. You know? who, who remembers the terms in the ethics section yeah. a year well, later? You can be highly ethical and fail the ethics section of the CFA. It's kind of ridiculous. But um, it's more a matter of this is a competitive endeavor that we do. Yep. So the CFA or the MBA, mm -hmm. to my mind, tells you as a young competitor in this business what everyone knows, what everyone's baseline training is. That's really it. You do learn. You pick up some techniques. Um, you do weed some people out, quite frankly, who really, they might say they're passionate about the business, but if it, you know, you're onto year five and they haven't quite managed to sign up for the <laughs> last section of the CFA, it's a bit of a tell, hey? So, um, but it's really more knowing what everyone else knows. Because, uh, I mean, uh, funny enough, I've got one of the, one of the students in my analyst academy course wrote to me and said, I don't know why I bothered with the CFA because I just needed to do this. And, you know, it's, it, I've trained people that have got the CFA and they, you know, they don't know the balance sheet, cash flow, p &L, how they fit together. I mean, it, it's just, it, I, I think it's really not serving our industry as well as it should because, you know, you're getting the chartered financial analyst after your name, but you don't actually know how to do analysis. I, I think it's no. a, a bit of a travesty. But let, 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 let's assume that everybody's got the, the, the basic skills. What then takes them that next stage up? The... So to me, that I like to think about it in terms of a pyramid. The bottom of the pyramid are the things that everyone needs to have, and you can't have the next layer of the pyramid without the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. So you do need to start from the bottom. And I... And, and quite frankly, I have met some analysts that early on have struck me as being having some of the elements at the top of the pyramid. It's highly unusual, right? And then you have to build everything under them. But um, that next level up, so bottom, bottom level are the nuts and bolts, the math, comfortable with spreadsheets and working your butt off uh, and having a passion for it. Without that, you know, why bother? Yeah. No, sure. And you need to be able to read a balance sheet and all that. Yeah. And uh, next level up is, by way of filter, is can they learn from their mistakes? And it sounds like such a simple thing. And it gets to sport. There are some incredible athletes who never get past Little League, much less high school or college, using American terms, because they won't learn. They know they're great. And when they make a mistake, it's someone else's fault. Or in this business, the market 
the market got it wrong. Yeah. And it's absolutely critical if you're going to be a good long-term investor to know that you're going to be wrong and what to do about it and how to learn from it. If you get that right, you can be, I think you can beat the market. You can be a good investor. The top of the pyramid, the special people, I believe have a, an innate ability to recognize patterns. They have no fear of being alone and wrong, of going a different direction. And this is the contrarian pyramid, right? Yeah. No, no, no. And, um, and then have a, an uncanny ability as well to uh, know when to overweight their future winners. You're going to have a portfolio. You know, um, Alan Gray, who's, who's no one would remember the name unless you're South African, but he had had an incredible batting average, in an incredible sort of ten alpha career, first at Fidelity, then building his own firm in in uh, Cape Town, and then Orbis. Um, refused all publicity, so no one knows who he is. But um, he, his batting average was fifty seven, fifty eight percent on getting a stock right or wrong. But adding, you know, where where were the weightings? His winners were bigger weights than his losers. And that is a, that's a skill that's, I, I would guess, nearly in, impossible to teach. That's real gut, discipline, um, nerve, the ability to be dispassionate. And then the, the last element, it's at the top of the pyramid just solely because it's about um, numbers is time. It takes a long time to prove that you're any good at this. You know, if this was, it's where the sports analogy breaks down, unless you want to say that, you know, half time in the investing sport is 15 years. So you, you learn a lot over time. You gain more patterns that you can put into mosaic um, and, and understand the complexity around an issue by knowing what you've known before. Why do you think then the average hedge fund manager is 42? Why? I mean, it seems to be considered a young man's field of endeavor. And I, I find this bizarre, right? Because I agree with you. I mean, look, I'm old, so I, you know, I've got a vested interest in this. But I, 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 I mean, think, I think hedge funds, you do lose your nerve. So I, they'd say that about traders, too. You know, on Wall Street traders are pretty famous for being athletes who, burn out or yeah. retire rich after they're 35. Um, I think uh, we're not hedge fund managers, so it's not really our our game. Um, so I, you know, maybe mutual fund managers or strategy managers are much older. Well, even even the mutual fund managers, I don't think the average age is much much higher than that. Well, that's a that's a pyramid effect too, right? The, yeah. The very best are are going to be older, I think. Yeah. No, I think that's fair. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and you can't. By statistically, that has to be true. Because you can't tell whether you're any good at this business or not uh, until you've been in it for 30 years. So the, there, I think there are a lot of, I mean, I was considered to be one of the, one of the top U.S. value investors when I was 40. But three years later, I was an idiot. <laughs> I was considered an idiot. I mean, so you can look at a 40-year-old and say, that guy's great. But two years later... You never heard of him. And then he might pop up a little while later in a, in, a, in another role or might be at the same fund and, and back in cycle. Uh, and you have to go through 12, 15 cycles before you know whether you're wiggling ahead or not. No, that's interesting. Isn't it? It's been really fascinating talking to you. I'm so uh, pleased. I've been looking forward to this. I always ask people the same closing question. Can you recommend a book or a practice or both to somebody that's thinking of, Becoming a, a, an investor. Well, I mentioned Stocks for the Long Run mm -hmm. uh, from Jeremy Siegel. I think that is a, it's a great starter for anyone who says, what's this all about? I think this is fascinating. It just gives you such a good primer on the history of markets. You know, it's the, it's the one book you can buy in a library or buy in a bookstore that has the critical charts in them that show you 
if you want to be a historian, and you need to be a historian in this business, uh, what the history looks like. The other is completely different. And um, I've given both of these to my 26-year-old daughter, by the way, who's, who's passionate about investing, is um, How to Think Like Da Vinci by Michael Gelb. And it is, it's if you want to be a really good investor. It, it teaches you, it's, it's a biography of um, da Vinci. And along the way, it's focused on how peculiar he was and how different he was and what his different disciplines were and what his different behaviors were and how far this dude thought outside the box and how healthy that is and how our education system over the last 50 years has tried to beat that out of people. And one of the, so I can summarize the entire book by saying, by, by one simple sentence, if da Vinci was alive today, he'd be medicated and in a special school. <laughs> we don't tolerate the da Vinci's of the day, of today. And that is, to me, if you want to be a great investor, read that book and explore your creative, innovative, nutty side that people look at you and say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. That's very funny because um, last month we had um, William Green. I actually recorded the podcast with William six months ago. And um, he was saying that, you know, in order to be successful, you're just going to be a little bit weird. And mm. that's exactly, it's very interesting. I've not, I've not read that book, so I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get Read that. it with your son. I think you enjoy it. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I, I usually steal his books because he, <laughs> he could, I mean, he's got a, a, he's a voracious reader. I mean, he's just been finishing Kissinger's book. And um, this is while he's doing his GCSEs. That was his way of unwinding was to, to read these, wow. these tomes. It was quite, quite impressive. Listen, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. It's been great. Well, I could have chatted for longer with Alec. I really enjoyed our discussion, particularly given our views on how markets may unfold in the next decade are quite similar. It's always dangerous to have that confirmation bias, but I think the facts in this case are unrefutable. A whole layer cake, as Alec puts it, of tailwinds becoming headwinds. I don't know whether inflation pans out at 5% or whether we could even slip back into deflation, which is the view of one commentator I have enormous respect for. All this is of course unknowable, but the odds are that investing will become even tougher. This may not be what listeners want to hear, but it's almost inevitable that investors will have to work harder and look more closely at balance sheets. We can help. Thanks as ever for listening and please share with all your friends and please follow us and leave a five-star rating in Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And if you're that way inclined, the podcast is now also available on our YouTube channel. See you next time. Thank you for listening. I'm Steve Clapham. That was the Behind the Balance Sheet podcast. Please don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And why not visit our website, behindthebalancesheet.com, where you can find the show notes and lots of other videos which can help you on your investing journey. Thank you for watching.